My next guest is an incredible character. Amongst other things, he founded Court TV and exposed the corruption inside our healthcare system. His latest book maps out how he says this country got to where it is and how we can fix it. It's called Tailspin, the people and forces behind America's 50-year fall and those fighting to reverse it. By the way, big news. It hit the bestseller list today, we're told. We're delighted that the author is here, Stephen Brill. It's fantastic to see Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Well, thanks for having me. It's really, it's a, I can vouch for this. I actually bought this book myself. I'm not just saying no, this you stuff. You put it on the list. Exactly. <laughs> and it's really, really good. Um, and I don't want to sort of take, take away any of your thunder. Just, just tell us the argument, and then we'll dive into it. Well, the argument basically is that beginning in the late 1960s, early 1970s, all these good things that were happening in America uh, gradually started to turn against us. Mm -hmm. uh, to take one example, uh, meritocracy, mm -hmm. obviously a great thing. I uh, got a scholarship uh, to Yale as a result of that. But uh, through a series of twists and turns, uh, the meritocracy uh, ended up um, arming all the institutions you were just talking about in your earlier segment with, uh, with people who were smarter and tougher and frankly, uh, uh, more inclined to achieve what they, uh, whatever they could on their mm -hmm. own and not worry about uh, the common good. So you run through the things like the financial sector, for example. Yeah, the financial sector is a great example. Uh, uh, the First Amendment. Uh, we all love the First mm -hmm. Amendment. But the First Amendment has been used, in essence, uh, to monetize uh, the political system in this country. So just uh, explain that. Through a series that. of court decisions yeah. that basically say, and I think actually rightly that um, the key thing about the First Amendment is uh, the benefit to those who listen to speech, not necessarily the speaker. Mm -hmm. So if the benefit is to those who listen, then why would you discriminate against those who are speaking and say, well, a person can speak, but a corporation can't? And that's a terrific argument until you look at it and say, well, what that means is that any corporation in America can uh, give as much money as it wants. Uh, to any uh, you know candidate that it wants, so I think what we need there is a constitutional amendment, uh, because um, as much as my liberal friends won't like this, uh, Citizens United, if you read the Constitution, I think was actually right, but we need to fix it. So one one last thing before I uh, ask Lisa to respond is the the, the way that financial engineering took right. over the economy and and pushed out manufacturing and, right. and that. Just explain how your Once argument you relates to that. you create a knowledge economy, mm -hmm. which is what uh, the meritocracy does, then uh, what a knowledge economy uh, really puts a premium on is knowledge. And that's legal knowledge or banking knowledge or, or the financial engineering uh, that basically turns the country into an economy where assets are traded, they're recategorized, you know, they're, uh, they're mm -hmm. turned into mortgage-backed uh, securities, uh, they result in stock buybacks, all this stuff that makes the bankers and the lawyers a tremendous amount of money, but doesn't build a single product or create a single job. In fact, it helps to kill jobs. So this is interesting, Lisa, because I just think that, that all these threads come together, I think, over, and you're saying it's 50 years to the moment where you find that people have had true. enough and they elect Donald Trump. Well, and, yeah, and so, I mean, how much, based off of your book, I mean, how much do you think all these different factors, as Steve just laid out, how much did that lead to where we currently are as, uh, well, in a political society? That, in fact, is the way the book ends, with people in the middle, the people who aren't in the knowledge economy, mm -hmm. who feel you know, so shut out and mm -hmm. so frustrated that they turn to a guy who, you know, who promises, I'm going to do everything that that uh, that um, is different. Now, which he has. <laughs> well, he <laughs> has, <laughs> but he's also done a lot of things that have hurt uh, the people uh, who voted for him. You know, when you get rid of uh, the payday lending regulations, so that payday lenders can go back and charge these workers who are still lucky enough to have jobs a um, hundred percent interest, uh, that's not a great thing. You talk about, too, you know, obviously the theme and focusing on these institutions that are now corrupt and have negatively impacted society. What, what other institutions... Hang on a second, this... let Lisa finish your point. Or no, I was just going to just gonna ask, you know, what other institutions do you, you know, sort of lay blame at or that you're looking at and you discuss in the book? Well, pretty much uh, the, uh, the legal economy, and I actually... Because you're a lawyer. In that. Yeah. Um, 
uh, uh, the financial economy, just the whole idea of, uh, yeah, I was, of, of the knowledge economy. But I was interested, it's not sorry, that they're corrupt stick with the legal thing evil. was really interesting. Sorry to interrupt, but um, uh, there's a really interesting point that I just hadn't thought of, which is the, pro the, the way due process and legal process has actually had such a negative impact, and the lawyers have sort of con got into everything. Just talk the number that of again. lawyers in Washington between 1973 and 1983 tripled. And what were they doing? They were lobbying, and they were lobbying in Congress and lobbying uh, the regulatory agencies. The first OSHA regulation in 1974 was 10 pages long and took less than a year to write, which I think is still too long. The last one written in 2017 was 604 pages long and took 19 years to write. So what do you think was going on in those 19 years? The lobbyists were fighting over, you know, and once they produce a 604-page regulation, then they can fight over all the paragraphs on all 604 of those pages when someone tries to enforce the regulation. That's yes. the economy we've and created. This, and, and the other point you make, Lisa, is that this empowers the big corporation, the big business, those who right. can afford the lawyers and everything. And again, that's part of this populist movement, which is people are sick of, the, of those, those, the big centralized organizations having all the power. Well, and then that was sort of the message that President Trump ran with during the election, right? It was, I'm standing up for the forgotten man and woman. Many people that felt like politicians didn't care enough to come and even speak with them. I mean, look at Hillary Clinton. She didn't even step foot in the state of Wisconsin, right? So those individuals in the state who felt like their voices were forgotten, obviously it was because you have someone like Hillary Clinton, who many deem an elitist, who didn't even bother to step foot and engage with yeah. those voters in the general election. Uh, so I think that was you know, largely uh, responsible for empowering President Trump and bringing think, him into office was that very message to those I think voters. that's exactly right. I'm so sorry. We have to leave it there for a moment. But you want to stay with us. We've got Absolutely. lots more to discuss.